I think Tom's Tom's comments this morning were were in a lot of ways new to me or synthetic in, in a bunch of new ways of sort of where non-market strategy came from and and how we got to here and and the first panel was meant to be sort of more senior people who, who did some of more of the initial work and, and could talk about it from different perspectives. What we tried to do with this panel and what I think is going to be really exciting about it is that pretty much everybody up here has done some kind of innovative work, innovative newer work and either brought in new data and found new data sets and figured out how that's useful to study non-market strategy and really get to the future of it, which was the point of it today, uh, or new methodologies. And what we want to sort of tease out is how can all of us in the room be able to do that in the future, find new data sets that, that are you know, useful um, and know that they're useful when that's a daunting task and try to import methodologies from other disciplines or find the right methodologies to use. And that's also potentially challenging. So basically, how do we get to be as, as kind of brave as some of the people uh, up here in, in doing that? Um, and I don't think Ronnie needs an introduction. Um, if you want one, I can give you <laughs> no, one. No, no, I'm good. But he's, he's very distinguished, and, and, and we're lucky to, uh, to have Ronnie uh, be able to moderate. Um, all right, great. Thank you, Brian. And thanks to all the organizers. This has been fantastic. I haven't been to a, a conference quite like this for a, for a long time, if ever. And I feel, I'm the one who feels honored to be here with uh, Caroline and Guy and Nate and May for what I think should be a really great panel. Um, I was kind of excited when I saw the list because even look at the diversity on this panel in terms of disciplinary perspectives and schools and experience and kinds of questions. You know all their papers, but they're very different. And so I thought we would try to get into that as we go forward. The first few panels and Tom's keynote address were a fantastic way to start. I think what we want to do with this panel is for all the junior scholars and PhD students out there, how do you do that, right? How do you, how do you find that seam within the field to contribute and do really good work? And so that's at least what I instructed the panelists um, about five minutes before this thing started. To, uh, so, so blame me, blame me. I'm very entrepreneurial in my research and my moderation, I guess. Um, but, but I thought that would be a really great way to sort of complement what we've done already. So if you were expecting something else, we're gonna give you a great time during the q and A. I'm gonna ask each of the speakers to just speak for about two to three minutes so we can avoid sort of going on for too long. And then based on that, kind of talk and have a moderated discussion for about 30 minutes. Use the balance of the time for your questions. And we'll get to your questions earlier if I feel like we're losing the juice up here. And what I asked each of the speakers to talk about broadly is how do you identify those great questions? We've seen Tom make suggestions about linking social movements and some of the positive political theory or formal work. We've heard V talk about this amazing trend in sort of the Western world with populism, particularly in the right wing side of the political spectrum and how it's affecting business government relations. How do you, how do you even think about going after those questions? And to the point on the earlier panel, how do you publish them in good journals? Because all these people have had a lot of success in that. So we're going to go from right to left and start with Caroline. And uh, after two minutes or so of each, we'll have a discussion based on kind of where the directions uh, seem to lead us. So Caroline, I'll hand it over to you. Thank you. Um, well, f first of all, thanks so much for inviting me to join this panel. Can you hear me in the back? I've, I've been, um, yes, OK. <clears throat> Please let me know if you don't. Um, it's a good question. <laughs> <laughs> Feel free to throw it back at me too if you want. It's, it's okay. Um, I would. I mean, I'm trying to ask relevant and important questions, and for that, I try to to talk to talk to real people, um, um, seek the exchange with industry experts. For example, one great source of 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 ideas for me is attend small conferences where you have a mix of let's say board of directors, investor communities, and a very few academics, and then exchange ideas and, and, and hear kind of what is pressing in their view. Um, and then I go back to, to the academic literature, try to find out what has been done theoretically, what has been done empirically, what do we know, and is there actually a research gap? Mm. And if there is actually a research gap, then I try to answer the question as rigorously as possible. Mm. I think that's... Yeah. So no, first lesson, avoid academics at all costs, right? No, no but, but I, I think there's a lot to be said for, you know, I'm surprised by how many people in this field aren't reading sort of the major newspapers and keeping track of these issues, right? It's, it's not only a theoretical enterprise, it has to be grounded somehow, at least the problems in the real world. So not being knowledgeable of what's going on in the world, not just the US, which is something that I think we all, you know, me personally, I try to strive to, 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 to kind of to go towards because there's so many interesting problems in this field outside the US as well. And, um, and I try to rely on my colleagues too when those issues come up. Guy, what about you? I mean, how, how do you approach these, these questions? How do you find good, um, good questions to ask? And then how do you go about answering them? 
Uh, so I agree with Caroline. Talking with practitioners in the field is always useful to see how they think about these problems. And I'm often uh, struck by how uh, differently practitioners tend to think about the non-market challenges than we tend to think about it. So we all tend to think about, OK, how do I design a lobbying, a lobbying strategy? How do I think about lobbying in a particular different uh, institutional context? And that's often not the, the frame of reference that practitioners have. Um, one thing that I found uh, useful in terms of inspiration is looking at some surveys of executives. Um, one uh, particular survey that got me uh, thinking about a new area, or not so much a new area, but an understudied area of non-market strategy. Uh, it's a piece of work by Peter Lord, some of you may be familiar with him. Um, he did a very interesting survey asking executives, you know, what do you find to be particularly influential in terms of trying to shake public policy? And he surveyed a broad range of uh, executives and also lobbyists. And there's a very consistent answer coming through. And it was really around not, not uh, campaign contributions and lobbying, but it was around grassroots mobilization and looking at the ability of companies to organize their constituents and to have this grassroots movement. So I think we've seen that echoed somewhat in some of the conversations uh, earlier today. Doug was talking about the rent to own. Uh, organization of people coming to testify in, in front of the legislature. Uh, Veet's work has done a lot recently on um, uh, the, uh, the importance of managing stakeholder relations for firm value. This, I think, is, is very consistent with the way that executives think about effective ways to try and shape their policy environment. And we've seen some examples with Uber right through its online petitions, trying to win various battles against the taxi industry. So I think you know, talking with executives or at least looking at signals of what executives think are important can be a way to uh, try and uh, directly connect with your own research and to shape your own research agenda. And Guy, when you interact with some of these sort of practitioners, I mean, sometimes they're not always very forthcoming, right? These are sensitive issues. And so how do you deal with that? I mean, is there, do you try to target practitioners who are maybe they recently left their post so they're more willing to chat? Or does it vary by company? Because uh, I think Susan's uh, speech was was she talked about this, where new, no two companies alike, no two companies are alike. So you might only hear from one, not the other. How, how do you balance that when you're talking to practitioners? Um, so in a public forum like this, like Susan, I, I'm not sure is, is Susan still here. So we don't have the opportunity to ask her here. But Susan's probably not going to say a lot of stuff in, in public yeah. uh, that we might be particularly interested in. But get to know them over time, invite them to come <laughs> speak to class uh, to classes, you know, have dinner with them, and as you build up their relationship, then they're going to become a bit more. Nate, what about you? I mean, you're coming at it uh, as a political scientist. You've been in a business school. You've been in a political science department. Um, how do you approach these questions? Is it any different from Caroline and Guy uh, based on your training? I mean, I, I also you know, would reiterate talking to practitioners. But I did do something when I was a director of grad studies in a political science department. And my grad students asked, how do you come up with ideas? And I said, I'm going to email the famous people across fields in political science and say, of your best papers, did you know that was a great idea when you started the project? Do you have other great ideas that aren't recognized? And almost uniformly, except for maybe one person, said, yes, I knew exactly <laughs> this was going to be famous. Almost everyone else said, you know, it was kind of the market decided what was the most interesting projects. And I actually have other projects that I think are more interesting. And the lesson that I took from that is that, in, in some sense, you want to generate a lot of interesting ideas, but you need to find some mechanism to help people vet which ones are valuable, which ones are interesting, which ones will fit in the literature. And then to figure out what formal mechanisms, not just conferences, there's a bunch of um, different organizations like EGAP experiments in, or evidence and governance and politics where they have a peer review mechanism. You come up with an idea and they send this to a bunch of other people to help vet, is it reasonable to do? Is it interesting? Is this too costly, too high of exit costs for this type of project? So I think one thing that, that I've learned is that generate a lot of ideas and then figure out ways to, to help people um, identify which ones are the ones moving that you should move forward with. So this is very interesting. So we have a sense of you know getting involved in the kind of the stream of ideas coming from practitioners, yeah. but building those relationships right often through sort of private collaborations offline. Given that people aren't necessarily willing to share everything in public forums, and the third is you know the generation of lots of ideas, throwing them against the wall to see what sticks. And so I teach an entrepreneurship class at Duke, and a lot of the things we advise our students about is how do you figure out whether your idea is any good? And it's very similar to the process Nate described. So for like the younger scholars, I think, well, what, do you have a system when you have an idea for how you're gonna take that out to quote the market, the market being the people uh, in this room, which is a great service that these guys have done is putting the people in this room or kind of your audience. So are you sending a random email to a senior scholar with an idea? Probably not. 
Are you going to start with a research group, maybe of three or four junior scholars who share your interest and maybe a little bit broader than that? That might be a better way to start. And then as you, as you sort of proceed and get feedback from folks, the market begins to tell you what to invest in. And so maybe you don't have to write six different papers to figure out what the market thinks, but you may have 12 different ideas that you can test. And so I, I think a lot about pipeline and how you structure projects. And I think Nate is very right that you know, it's very hard to know which idea is going to be great from the very beginning. Um, so May, I mean, for your part, you're distinctive in many ways, but one of the ways <laughs> One of the ways of research, well, you know, May comes from an interesting perspective with a PhD and a JD, right, which is a nice combination for what we do, and particularly non-market strategy. But the other interesting thing is, you know, you've also collaborated with people very different across disciplines. And so Tim is one here in the audience that you worked with as a political scientist, but published in a sociology journal, right? So how did, you, how did you come up with the ideas, or how did you two come up with the idea for the paper? How did you decide to work together? And then journal selection, which is a big issue for junior scholars. Yeah, so I'll, I'll just start with sort of the, the the me side of the story before I give Tim his due share of my side of the story too. So um, I think, you know, I think to come up with innovative ideas, it's nice if you can approach a discipline or conversation from the lens of another discipline or conversation because you're, you're just going to see holes in the discussion and you're going to see opportunities to contribute that, that other people that are kind of steeped in that discussion might not see. So I think um, just happenstance for me. I started out in law school and I thought I wanted to be a law professor and I'd, I'd studied business ethics. I was a philosophy major in college. So I went to law school wanting to know how we can use regulation to make companies ethical. And that's what I wanted to study and I was going to be a legal academic. And so I centered in corporate governance and corporate law and spent two years just studying this. And in the second year, um, the Great Recession happened. And all of a sudden, all of my friends weren't getting jobs, even graduating from Harvard Law School, and people were getting furloughed. And it seemed to be all companies' fault. And I had been studying how we regulate firms, and I wasn't seeing any movement among regulators. So that was a really jading moment for me where I thought maybe the solution to the big problem that I'm interested in shedding light on is not formal regulation at all. Maybe we need to look for other um, opportunities. And at the same time, I saw things like Occupy Wall Street happening. All of a sudden, there was all of this resurgence of social activity and then social targeting of firms. And so I thought maybe that's where the action is. Maybe we need to actually think about social movements role in affecting corporate behavior. So I uh, went to get, uh, took a leave of absence from law school. I went to get a, uh, I did finish eventually, but I did take a leave of absence. I went to get a PhD in um, work theory at Kellogg, and I was so lucky because the year I arrived at Kellogg was also the year that Braden King arrived at Kellogg. So all of this is kind of luck. So a lot of, of generating good ideas is luck of timing. So I was lucky that the Great Recession happened when I was in law school. I was lucky that I landed at Kellogg right when Braden King landed. Um, and so, you know, there's there's a story about coming from a different discipline, not just sort of steeping yourself in one discipline, but thinking about how two different disciplines connect with each other. Um, the third way in which I was lucky, and I think has contributed to uh, what success I've had, is that I got invited to come and give a talk at, at, at to Tim's group here at Texas. Um, and maybe my second, it was before I had a, academic job even. Yeah, I was a visiting professor of law at Northwestern when this happened. So I came down to give a talk and in this discussion with Tim after my talk, Tim threw, a, we talked about a Politico article that he'd seen and we realized that if we took my dissertation data on social activist boycotts and Tim's data for a book he'd just written on corporate political activity, we could kind of connect two different fields and look at the effects of social activism on corporate uh, political activity. But these were two dissertation size data sets, right? So it's not something that either one of us could have possibly done on our own. So I think the third way to be innovative is to be willing to collaborate with each other to kind of overcome the data problems that we have, to put really interesting data together in a way that we can understand how the kinds of phenomena we're interested in relate with one another. Yeah, the political article, again, links back to what you know, Caroline and others have said, which is being enmeshed in the real world to kind of think about what research mm -hmm. questions are interesting. Like, another market test is not just with academics, but you know, I get many more journalist calls about CEO activism than I do about entrepreneurship and innovation, okay, which are two areas I'm working on. And just, I have a sense, people are very interested in CEOs speaking out on social political issues. They're interested in the Washington Post, they're interested in CNBC, and they're interested in Wired Magazine and everywhere in between, and just that, outpouring of journalistic support so is that, okay, people want to write about this. Now, 
that's an open question whether there's actually enough to do research on. So that's something I think that tricks, you know, can trick us up sometimes in terms of understanding whether there's enough there there. May for you, another thing I think is interesting is like, one thing we have to do with these new methods is act, uh, acquire new skills. And so we talked about this at Duke the other day where, you know, you said your favorite thing is to go back to your room and start coding, which I thought was really cool because for a lot of lawyers, that's not something maybe they did in law school. So I imagine something that you acquired later on. Mm -hmm. So as all of us are doing sort of new methods, um, some of us field experiments, some of us using uh, network data, what's, what's been your approach to acquiring new skills? Um, and, and how do you think the, for people in the room who might be in one area but trying to transition or collaborate, how should they, how should they look at that? I don't, I really love just coding data and, and working in state ag. If I, if I had won a million dollars tomorrow and I didn't have to, to do this job, I would still want to do it. It's like what I would do for fun. Really? So yeah, I really would. I love, I love, I like to put my grocery list in Excel for the whole week. I just love like data. I just love looking at everything in that way. So I'm sort of a weirdo and maybe not the right person to, to ask about this question. But I do think, I actually think you learn an awful lot, and I was just talking with Brayden about this earlier today. You learn an awful lot about methods in the review process. So a lot of times it's hard to kind of figure it out on your own, but reviewers oftentimes show you how to find the holes in your data and your skills and then, then you're sort of forced to fill them and figure things out uh, in that process. Yeah, the other thing I want to move to is I think each of the researchers up here kind of has a brand, something you know them for. Um, if you don't, you should read their papers and, and know them for it. So, and I think establishing that's a really important part of the junior faculty trajectory and beyond. So Caroline, I mean, I think for you, uh, you know, when I think about your work, the key words that come up are sort of corporate social responsibility, financial report performance, causal identification. And I don't know if that's fair, those are the tags, and do people agree with me, right? I mean, and, but see, that's, but that's, that's really good, right? Because if the, if the 20 people in this room recognize those tags as Caroline, it makes it much easier when people write tenure letters, when people are commenting on her work, to make an impact, and that's why you'll see she's had a ton of impact with, across many papers. She has many papers that are cited like over 200 times for like a, a, junior, a relatively junior scholar, that's, that's really rare. So was that something you did deliberately? Was it something that you thought about that there was one big project sort of sliced into more? Um, and, and any advice on how to build that kind of sort of brand around a set of papers that are all on pretty different things, but, but I would say those tags maybe describe 80, 90% of your papers, which is, which is interesting. Um, <clears throat> let me approach this question to two parts. Um, first of all, to me, I know methods play a somewhat uh, take up some space in my papers, let me put it this way, but I would never put the methods as core, mm. um, as key, and it's not gonna give you a publication. Um, um, to me, I'm trying to ask important questions and then just try to answer them in the most rigorous way and try to understand, okay, what kind of methods can I use in order to answer the question? Mm -hmm. um, just to, um, this is one way. Um, <coughs> No, I forgot the other way, what I wanted to say. Oh, um, I tr in terms of coherent research agenda, um, I try to limit the number of papers I'm working on um, to a few and push them through. Um, one way is I can't handle too many projects, and probably, as any of my co-authors would agree, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a control freak. <laughs> <laughs> and so, I rather wait until a paper is published and then follow up based on that project and do another paper. And I think that led to a fairly coherent research agenda because I would kind of waited um, to see how it goes. And it also gives you cues of, oh, what do people find interesting? And this way you might go into the direction where, um, going back to Nate's point, you get a sense of well, what is more, more perceived to be more interesting and important by people. And when you came to this field though, I mean, there were like hundreds of papers written on these topics of corporate financial performance, and corporate social <laughs> performance, right? So for many people, that's a that's a barrier. Like, why would I try? People are trying to figure this out. It's really hard to figure out. There's this Margolis and Walsh really interesting review that talks about all the papers as a meta analysis. Why that? Why not go to some greenfield area? What made you want to look at some? I mean, a pretty central question that a lot of people had tried to answer, and you've, you've brought something new to it. But what, what what made you want to do that? Certainly not an advisor who suggests <laughs> <I should do laughs> it. <laughs> Avoid academics, choose a bad advisor. These are the two things. No, I'm kidding. But no, but so, right? so, but, 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 I mean, it's an interesting question because I have a lot of PhD students who might be scared to go after a field that they're, they, they're sense there's too much work going on there or they can't make a contribution. So how, how, do, you, how do you think about that? Uh, I mean, the CSR financial performance relationship is often considered to be the holy grail yeah. of, of the literature. Um, but what 
so, and it's great literature. I mean, there are 200 plus studies out there, but all of them are, are endogenous. I'm not saying we don't learn anything from them. I think they're very enriching and very good, but it's not causal. And there's a huge, in, in terms of, I mean, let's be clear, theoretically wise, there's a, there's a very limited uh, contribution you can make, I would say zero. Um, but empirically, the, the contribution is potentially high. Mm. Um, and so it took me a while, probably took a couple of walks on the beach in Costa Rica, watching the monkeys <laughs> and toucans, or I don't know, whatever I did. Uh, <laughs> but at some point, it came to my mind that there were some studies in econ and political science that looked at close call elections in Swiss cantons. Um, and then I figured companies also have voting, meaning shareholder voting. And so then another inspiration I got from the finance literature, they looked at shareholder activism and voting, and so and the rest is history. The rest is history. Yeah. But that's I mean, clear example of arbitrage from another field, right? So Caroline's very smart, but she didn't create the idea of close elections, neither did I. We've both used it in different papers now for some effect uh, because it was used in different literatures, and people have done that with the political connections literature and lots of other things. So reading widely, I think, could be could be one another part of this. I, I find too many people are sort of reading the literature in their specific journal and not, you know, I ask them about a paper in another area, and they're like, well, I never heard of that person or that thing. And to the extent, you know, I think about the design PhD <coughs> syllabi and talk to my students is to read across fields. Like, so you should be reading all the way from ASQ all the way to QJE and everything in between. It's like something I think about, you know, and, and, and maybe AJS, AS are some of those, especially if you're in a business school like many of us are. I want to skip Guy for a second. I have a question for you, but Nate, on this point, you do a lot of experiments. So field, large, innovative field experiments. When I first talked to Nate about his research, I was like, I got to work with this guy. I was stunned how, how cool things, the things you were doing. But why is causal identification so important for people in this room? I mean, Caroline stated it like it was an obvious thing. You, you believe, I think, in that too, which is why you do field experiments. Why should people care so much about causal identification in this world, in, in this particular group? I mean, I think, I think what's kind of funny is I, I started doing some experimental work because I had observational work as well. So I thought of it as part of a portfolio that I'm doing this topic and I've done different pieces of this project and then trying to nail the causal identification is just a part of the bigger question. So some of it's descriptive, some of it is interview data. And so I, I've always thought of that as a, you know, the experimental work as a nice complement to mm -hmm. existing work. And I think sometimes that can get lost, especially in the development debate, for example, that it seems to be causal ident identification or nothing. Um, so, so, you know, that's kind of, a, I guess, an odd answer, but I, I really came to it from a frustration of not being able to identify something causally in my own work, mm. rather than looking for things to identify in other, in other topics. I mean, it's notable, both you and Caroline, despite using great methods, cutting edge methods, you're identifying yourself around a set of questions and theories. So that, I think that's, that's a good sort of lesson also. One question, you also attacked or went after a question that a lot of people have answered in, in one of your papers, the liability of foreignness. That's like a fundamental concept in international business. A lot of papers, I mean, more than 200, right? 10,000, okay? But you went after it and did an experiment on this, and it's part of some work we've done together. Um, and found some results that were consistent with the literature, which, which seemed interesting. So, I mean, what, how did that sort of, you know, affect the way you look at research and did you get sort of good productive interactions with people who are doing that kind of work and, and where has that led? Uh, yeah, I mean, the curse of the null result, um, yes. especially when the whole, a whole other literature says something, uh, you know, I, I don't know. I mean, it's a difficult, it's difficult to answer. The one thing, you know, we've talked about this, the one thing that there's been some movement towards pre-registration of experimental work so we laid out very clearly what our, theoreti uh, our th theoretical prediction was and what the literature said, and we found null results. So I think a lot of people were more willing to accept their null results as something that's you know, not something that we're trying to destroy a literature with. It's something that we actually think is really interesting in this context, we didn't find it. So I think that, that helped in some sense, that we had strong priors that this would fit with the existing literature, but yet we found evidence that we could report that, that wasn't consistent. And then Guy, for you, I think one trademark of your work is like this mixed <laughs> interplay between theory and empirics, and mm -hmm. coming from the same program as you, I know some of the influences on you, and co-authors like Rick Vandenberg, and then mentors like Pablo and others. If you have a grad student, or you think about yourself, and you're, they're gonna start a project, do you tell them to start with a theory? Do you tell them to go get a data set first? Uh, how do you think about that? Because I often have trouble advising my own students. They have great ideas, but if there's no possible data set and they're designed, they want to be an empirical scholar, 
it's sort of like difficult to tell them to chase the theory for six months without any data. But then I sort of feel dirty if I tell them look for the data set and then think about the theory, right? So, so how do you manage this? So I would almost say the tendency is actually in the opposite direction. Data is so ubiquitous at the moment, I almost feel like it's easier to put together a data set and get distracted by that and start mucking about with it without actually having a clear uh, theoretical direction and having an idea of what are the theoretical premises that I want to test, what are the theoretical gaps that I want to really try and address and develop, and figure out, well, what's my causal chain of logic before then getting into the data to test something quite scientifically. I think it's much easier to go down that data route uh, first. Um, and I think it, it's hard for PhD students just because being really familiar with the literature gives you, uh, makes it easier to identify, well, these are some of the uh, issues that we don't understand, to have that sort of broad sense of the literature, and to figure out, well, look, these are the areas where we haven't really explored. Here are some potential linkages with other disciplines. Um, so I think that's the part where advisors can be particularly helpful in terms of identifying new opportunities for, for graduate students before they start trying to build their own data sets. Mm -hmm. And May, like a lot of your work, I think, um, you know, has a strong theoretical component. It's, it's different than some of the theory we were talking about before on the positive theory side. It's, it's more related to sort of the theory that you see in the places you've published, AS, ASQ, AJS, and AMJ. When you're thinking about defining that theoretical contribution, that thing that Braden said is so tricky, and the reviewers are always, I mean, there's two reviewer tricks, right? One is no theoretical contribution. The other one is endogeneity, right? They're just like, I should have like a card that I just hold up no matter whatever paper, right? If it's, and you know, and then either one or both can kill it. So with theoretical contribution, I mean, that's, that's a tough thing. When I've tried to publish in some journals that, that say that's the most important thing, I struggle a lot in terms of how to identify that, particularly in non-market strategy where there's so many different sort of papers and literatures What's been your approach in the papers you've, you've done where you think it's worked out well, where you've kind of narrowed in on that theoretical contribution early on? I think I, I, don't, I am not driven toward ideas by theoretical gaps, per se. That's just not the way I engage with the process. I, I try to find interesting problems that I can't answer. So, you know, reading the newspaper, just talking to people about their findings. I try to think about what about this is really interesting and that WIC I can't explain with all of the theories that I've been you know, taught so far. And that's what drives me toward projects. And then you know, I think the theory building as, as you're trying to figure out the answer to a problem, for me, it, it, it's in some part kind of framing. So it, it is something that's sort of being forced on to me, I feel sometimes, mm. by the review process and by the, the journalistic requirements for the, the outlets that I publish in. So I, I, would, I would love to say that that's you know, how I engage with the field, because I think that that is kind of purer, a purer way to engage with the field. But I, I, you know, I, I'm more driven by problems than theory, honestly. Yeah, I think it's a good question. That I love to hear people's thoughts in the audience. I think a lot of people, and May's very honest in terms of the way she approaches it, even people who have theoretical contributions to their paper, they often start with a phenomenon and then they get interested in it and the theory infrastructure kind of builds around it and it depends on the journal you're submitting it to and the review process. But that may or may not be our sort of ideal of what theory should be. When you talk about theory, right, you think about it sort of leading you to know what kinds of questions you should ask with the data. And I, I think about it very similar to May. I read a political article and I write a paper and then I, I figure it out, right? But, but that's, that's, that sort of seems at odds with a lot of the requirements of some of the journals around theory and what it's supposed to do. Um, so that's one thing I'd, I'd love for you to think about and maybe ask about. I also want to ask each of you about sort of teaching, given that students are so interested in these topics. Um, to what extent do you bring your own research into the classroom? Um, has that worked for you? And have you designed your courses that you teach to MBAs, undergrads, or others in ways that sort of inform your research? Because I think one of the key ideas for people in the room is you're doing teaching, you're spending a good amount of time on it. Some people teach more than others. Is there a way to make that sort of more aligned with your research? Um, so Caroline, any ideas on that, having taught at least two schools? Um, <coughs> yes, so um, I'm teaching, currently I'm teaching strategies for growth at BU, so it's not necessarily non-market strategy per se, but so the way I try to incorporate research, whether it's my own or any of yours, um, is, and also this links to our earlier question, your question actually, how do you engage with the classroom, should we bring in our values, etc. Um, it's case-based, but then I bring kind of, okay, this is what we know from research, now how does this, what we observe in the world, whether it's a political 
statement or something, how does that make sense based on the research insights we have? Mm. And I find students, I think to believe that students very much appreciate that and it also sparks conversation among the students. So I'm not, maybe it's because I'm Swiss and trying to be neutral, but um, I'm, I'm, actually try <laughs> I'm actually trying to trick our students to be the devil's advocate of each other and then force them to reason, uh, yeah, challenge them challenge each other, but I do bring in research. But this is one takeaway I will have from the conference already that V kind of reinforced and you're saying, which is there's a way to talk about these issues in the classroom without sort of naming names and taking a political position. It's going to the research and saying, what do we know? And I think for all of our students in the classroom who, I mean, they'll be diverse politically if you're at, a, you know, at, at most institutions, you know, I think they'll probably appreciate that, but you can also not avoid complex issues at the same time, right? That we obviously live in a politically charged environment. Guy, I've asked you for a bunch of syllabus uh, requests and mm -hmm. we use one of your yeah. cases on the Keystone Pipeline. Mm -hmm. how, do, how do you do that? I mean, you're, you've, you've been teaching really well for a long time at a school that you know, is, values it quite a bit. So how do you, how do you manage that? Um, so I taught a couple of uh, courses over the last few years. I've taught a, a PhD course, um, a law market strategy a PhD course. I emailed lots of people here asking, hey, do you have any syllabuses as I was trying to put, put my own together? And I um, actually was surprised that very few people teach PhD uh, courses in, in law market strategy. So if any of you um, get the opportunity, I would uh, strongly encourage that because um, it's, uh, it's, it's a lot of fun. I think it's an important way to train the next generation to uh, PhD students. But obviously then it's much easier to, to bring in your own uh, research. On the undergraduate side, um, I agree there's a lot more interest these days amongst the undergraduate population in these sort of business, uh, sort of social and, and political issues, uh, certainly compared to 10 years ago when it seems like it was a bit more tangential and not really sort of core to how businesses create value, sort of uh, broadly, broadly conceived. That's less of a hurdle uh, these days. Um, I found it interesting because when you talk about sort of lobbying strategy and you talk about managing relationships with politicians, regulators, stakeholders, and so forth. What I find challenging to overcome is the sort of simplistic student reaction often as well. How do you deal with this type of non-market problem or challenge? Like um, uh, Susan was talking about that long list of issues that she's confronting as AMD. And uh, students will often say, well, we just lobby more. And that's, that's the standard answer. You just throw some more uh, lobbying dollars at it. And um, so clearly this is a reflection you know, of the, uh, the way that we approach teaching. It's uh, easy for students to fall into this trap, but I think we, and uh, particularly myself, we need to work out a way really to think about sort of strategy in a, in a more integrated way. It's not just, okay, I can pull this lever and firm performance is going to improve. It's much more complex than that. I think trying to convey that complexity to students is, is difficult. Um, bringing in uh, outside speakers always helps. Mm -hmm. uh, it's mm -hmm. good for us. It's a way for us to learn as well. And you can have people Skype into a PhD seminar. I mean, what yeah. a lot of us do is someone says, I'm teaching a PhD class at 3 p.m. I'm going to talk about some of your work, related work, and you just Skype in. So that's a great way if you're in a place where people aren't passing through. It's easy to Skype and it's a good interface. I also think with the PhD syllabi, exposing people to a large number of methods is, is really good. So like when I think about like the toolkit that I would give to someone who's trying to change non market strategy, I think about like lots of different developments across fields that are interesting. Like in economics, there's a bunch of really cool theory models in terms of timing, sequence, and the value of delay. And what Susan said about the timing and sequence of their actions and when to jump in, it just strikes me that like, that's a really key fundamental piece of that that you could build from some of the econ theory into more into non-market strategy. If you think about like the insider econometrics movement like in economics, you know, where Steve Levitt and others kind of had sort of these really great and great administrative data from inside firms, right? There are things you can do about politics inside firms with that kind of data that I would like to expose my students. And then the field experiments, like the large field experiments that Nate and others people have done, there's just the cutting edge keeps moving. So learning about how to pre-register, learning about the basics of power calculations, learning about the IRB process, learning about like this, given this is gonna take a year and probably like $100,000 for like a real, really good experiment, which projects do you choose and, and carefully, right? And replication is gonna be a huge issue because even after you run a field experiment, the reviewers will tell you to replicate it. So these are some of the things I think about in terms of what I put in the PhDs little list to help people learn you know, sort of, you know, and the other one I'd say from sociology, particularly uh, Kellogg Braden's group is doing a good job in this, is sort of large scale network analysis. So bringing together computer science and sociology to think about all those relationships between all these stakeholders. We put up a great chart related to that. So those are the kinds of things I think about putting on, on a syllabi. Um, I'll go to Nate and May, and then uh, if you have questions, I think that would be great to, to go to your questions. and.
If we don't, we can we can ask some more up here. Nate, any um, sort of differences between teaching in the business school versus teaching in a government or political science department, and in terms of how it's affected your research? So in, in a political science department, you have a lot of PhD classes. So you have a lot of students in a class, and you have a number of students who've taken the same sequence. So I'll teach an international political economy class knowing that all my students have stats one, two, and experiments. So what I often do is try to expose them to the most cutting edge methods that's linked to sub substance or methods that aren't linked to substance but could be a good fit. But the other thing that we, we do is often have replication exercises. Mm. So students are forced to find data on a project and if they can't, how would you recreate the data? So you have to write up the coding document of how to do this. And, and I think that helps a lot, both me and the students, to see not just how do you generate an idea but how do you implement it. And again, this isn't about whether something replicates or not, but if you were really gonna do a project similar to this or if you wanna build on it, how hard would it be? What are the exit costs if you start and it doesn't work? Um, what are the different choices that you need to make up front in terms of sample size? And often that can be through a power calculation, but often it's seeing the data and the distribution of the data. So I think especially like a replication ac exercise is, is really, really valuable for the students, but also if it's close to your own research area, you get a better sense of what the barriers are to entry to some new data, data intensive project. Fantastic. And May, what about you? I mean, in your teaching, and also the point you made earlier about that maybe this movement towards keeping students safe in classroom and not mm -hmm. challenge. I thought that was very interesting. All my students are dead. Right. Yeah, no, but I, I thought that was really interesting. So, to the extent that you operationalize that in the classroom or how that affects your teaching. Would be yeah, I teach I teach with the Socratic method because I started in law school and I taught for two years in a law school before. That was my first teaching experience. So that's just the way I know how to do it, which means that you don't lecture; you just ask questions and. So, you know, I, I just basically always play the devil's advocate. So it's not that I'm kind of advocating for one position, but I do force them to, to face the really hard points about the, the, the opinions that they'll express. I'll give the best argument and, you know, counter to the opinion they've expressed and make them really defend it. So it's, it's about making them uncomfortable. It's about making them challenge their own priors. I'm so lucky because I got to I get to teach an elective at Warden and I teach corporate governance and I basically taught it I've, I've reconstructed the class from the ground up so we do a third of the semester at the firm level a third of the semester at the market level where we get to talk about markets for corporate control but also kind of industry solutions to to problems um, private governance and then the last third of the class I do it's non-market solutions to governance so you know where do social movements play a role where does uh, political action and corporate political activity play a role in governance so i get to really emphasize non-market strategy quite a bit in my teaching which is really fun for me it's also a great point for research i mean one of the things we haven't talked enough about is probably multi-level analysis and the idea that you know another thing that sort of their opportunities for. So many of us do work at the firm level, okay, especially in business schools. There's also this opportunity to do stuff at the individual level. And then Kate, where's Kate? Yeah, so you, you have a paper that I'm reading for this workshop we're gonna do, right? Yeah, you remember, that's your paper. <laughs> you're like, I remember. No, but it's at the field level in some sense. I mean, your dissertation will be at the field level, thinking about how the organizational field, these activist groups may segment or coalesce, um, and that might affect their strategy. So like, at all these different levels, there are different methods that you can use. Um, but sometimes, I think, for me, collaboration has been really useful. Because it's really hard to learn all this new stuff, um, especially at a certain stage. And so whether it's a new method or a new theoretical lens, cooperating with people who are interested in the same phenomenon, so there's at least some common bridge, has been something that I've found very fruitful. So I would say that would be the other piece of advice I'd give people in the audience. Um, why don't we then now open it up for questions from the audience. And don't worry if you're shy, because I have a bunch of backup questions too. I prepared the panel by asking them exactly zero questions that were on our agenda. <laughs> and so that, that will allow them to respond very, you know, sort of, you know, sort of skillfully to your unexpected questions. But I think we, we got some interesting points. So I actually are there any... have a, I have a big question. Oh, big question, yeah, okay, this is good. See, May's not turning on me. Okay, yeah, go, yeah, okay. tell me your question. All right, here's my question. So uh, coming from, law school, what is striking to me is that we talk about government, but we almost never talk about the law. So we don't usually talk about how firms try to shape the judiciary. And, and even in the models that we've looked at today, the judiciary is never in the model, but it seems to be playing a really important role in kind of interpreting how firms can engage with government and constraining them in various ways today. Uh, so I was wondering, like, is that is that an opportunity that we're not taking advantage of to, to actually think about the judiciary as a part of this non-market model? 
political science literature on it. John Figueroa has done some work on it. Yeah. And Guy, I don't know if you, some of Pablo's work is probably, I mean, mm -hmm. early work is on sort of working the judici judiciary and veto points and things like yeah, that. Yeah, it's more from an, uh, from an interest group uh, point yeah. of view rather than a firm strategic point of view. Well, that's but, interesting. but I think it is a sort of big sort of missing area of non-market strategy and we know that the courts can be an important check mm -hmm. uh, on governments and bureaucrats and typically for firms if they're unhappy with say what a, a regulator has done then often the first port of call is to go to the courts uh -huh. uh, rather than to go to the legislature. But it is an area that we haven't really looked at very much. Mm -hmm. uh, I agree. Yes. But surely these five or six articles have been written don't define that really big question of how companies could engage with the judiciary, right? It just like when Tom when Tom was presenting, it wasn't in the model. So we see government's role, and we see and the courts seem to be, have some kind of a role in that model that's not kind of depicted in any representation of it I've seen. And twice people asked. You know, said that we should be we should be asking about if firms should be engaging the government and how because if we don't ask who will and I was thinking lawyers will <laughs> that's what lawyers are doing too I mean that's why Citizens United is a court case you know so I feel like that's a an audience that's kind of missing to a large extent from this conversation that should be in it. And, and this, this work in this area that May's talking about would, would also affect, all of us who are using legal decisions as quote, quote, exogenous shocks um, in terms of like to get identification. I mean, the biggest question in, in all those papers is, is it really exogenous, right? So if, if legal decisions and other things are affected by all these different actions, right, and they, they know we've had this conversation, <laughs> then it does change the basic identifying assumptions in, 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 those, in those empirical frameworks. I think it's like another way to kind of get a twofer with uh, you know something interesting from a phenomenological point of view, but also hitting methods. Um, yeah, on this one. Yeah, go ahead. Sure. Right. Also having a legal background, uh, there's only a few of us that's actually doing work in the legal area. I did notice there's a huge void discussion on it, even though our guest speaker talked about how she reported to the uh, to the legal council, and, and the, uh, so I think there is a huge gap and void there. Uh, maybe some of us are trying to fill. So I don't want to plug my own research, but like there's some special issues on CPA that have been coming out. Uh, Journal of World Business, MIR has got, I think, a special issue coming out here soon where some of this research is starting to be explored a little bit more. Mm -hmm. uh, go ahead. Yeah, I think this fits into a, a bigger question. I mean, political science, you know, standard 101 question is how a bill becomes a law, right? The way to flip that around is when does a bill become a law? rather than how. And if you're anticipating court actions down the road, how does that affect <coughs> corporate strategy? You know, what, what's built in the law in terms of waivers? What's built in the, you know, or was this all decided at some subcommittee markup? And once that happened, you knew it was going to be enforced, right? And, and so I don't think we wrestle enough with what actually is the law if it's uncertain if in fact that is how it's going to be enforced or ultimately get resolved. And the courts obviously play a potential role in that process, right? And I don't think we, you know, we I talked about the federalism introducing that as a way of getting some cross-sectional variation. You know, in, in money and politics, people you know look at variation in state campaign finance laws. And I explained to my students, I said that's interesting, but that's not necessarily what the law is. It's what's enforced, and it makes it very, very difficult use that approach, and it's also how the courts are treating it at local or national levels, right? And so just, it's part of that process, but it's a, and it's really, really important. Um, so in terms of research gap, I mean, I agree that the relationship with the legislator, that is one thing, but I think one aspect we haven't touched on is non-market strategy so far has mainly looked at the relationship, how can companies influence and it are influenced by the government, by the, by the rule setting, correct? Kind of how to shape the business environment. What we have largely neglected is the government as a customer. So the business to government market, which comprises about 20% of GDP, which is quite significant, but neither non-market strategy scholars nor strategy scholars per se have really looked at it. Um, so I, I do have one paper where I look at how can com companies compete for uh, government procurement contracts, but there's a huge research gap, so huge potential for 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 delving into that. And a great and the data is public. It is, and a great opportunity for arbitrage again. If you read journals like the Journal of Public Economics, there's a ton of interest in economics on 
procurement. So you could bring in, and they're asking different questions, you could bring some of that stuff in to, to do work in strategy where it's, it's probably less represented, I agree with you. There's also been some interesting shocks. Uh, Raman Ananda has a cool play, uh, paper on supplier pay, which is like basically under the Obama administration, um, they reduced the number of days it would take to, to pay the small businesses uh, and other kinds of businesses from 30 to 15 days. That has huge impacts on the working capital for small businesses if they're gonna get paid half as, right, in half as much time. So if you look at Ramana, it's N-A-N-D-A and Jean-Noël Barreau, uh, right, who is now, in, he's, he's coming full circle. He was elected along with um, the recent uh, in Macron, right, in, in France. He's now in the, the French legislature. So a political economist who's in the French legislature, is amazing. But they have a paper together on this procurement and some of these changes. So you have these interesting changes between governments or policies that you can exploit as well. Um, and you know, and the defense industry is just one place you can look at that, but there's there's lots of others. Um, other other questions, everybody? Yeah, so just to add <clears throat> to the points made by Ronnie, yourself, and Caroline, uh, recently I've been looking at the marketing literature mm -hmm. uh, and the communication literature that's kind of forming in the area of political marketing is something that is catching traction and reputation management is another area that's been in the forefront in that field for a long time, but. We never talk to each other. <coughs> mm -hmm. And just recently I've been talking to some marketeers and it's amazing how they're using some other lenses for marketing and, and looking at the customers and, and how they approach uh, rhetoric and positioning and all the kind of interesting things that we talk about in, in our literature. They talk about it using some other kind of concepts. But again, it's another field that we haven't really talked to in different ways. And, and I think they have some really interesting things around reputation management. Wait, is political marketing propaganda? What? Yeah, yeah, so it's kind of like propaganda literature, but, but it's uh, getting a lot into also some of the social media stuff and getting into the social platforms and talking about Twitter and all the other kind of channels to engage with government. So I think that's another area, but yeah, you just made me think. Well, and these communication mechanisms can become central. So talking to one company about their CEO, he's on the East Coast, and he would tweet out sort of responses to things like the immigration ban, for example, or the Charlottesville events and aftermath before the communications office on the West Coast could, could do their own tweet. And this caused a big problem in the company in terms of how to navigate this because, you know, 20 million people saw this tweet or something like that. And they, have the, they of course, have the metrics, which is another great thing about all the social media stuff is there are ways to track how many people view these posts and retweet it and stuff like that. I would say the PR and communication side, which we normally kind of eschew because, I don't know, it just seems like a different thing from us and we, don't, we haven't viewed them as doing things that are as scientific, but actually they're using tons of data. They're hungry for answers from us um, on these kinds of issues. Companies like Edelman um, and um, the Global Strategy Group are building entire practices around CEO positioning using kind of ideas from non-mark strategy and CSR and they're really hungry for the kind of knowledge that, that we're providing, right? So something else that we haven't talked about directly today and other actors is actually the media, mm -hmm. right? So we teach at Baron Class, the like media is part of it. Um, and I just wanted to get any reactions on why we haven't talked about the media recently, particularly given you know, there's an increasingly large literature in econ on the media and political science and media bias and yeah. why, why we've sort of stopped talking about that uh, when it's something that historically has been there and Th things or? seem to be going so well in the media now. It seems to be at a peak, you know. Probably <laughs> that's why we just thought, hey, let's ignore that for a little bit. We'll come back to it when there's a real crisis. No, I would, I, I would yeah, say the media is the is the core. But we also use it for data too. Right? Definitely. In, in Definitely. No, I'm with you. I mean, I think Tim Tim Grosskos's work and Jesse Shapiro. There's been some really interesting stuff going on in, in terms of studies of the media. In strategy, where I've seen it has been like the work that uh, Villanova Rendova here at, uh, who is, I'm sorry, formerly of Texas, now at USC, has done on sort of uh, CEO celebrity um, and, and it involves sort of media creation. But, you know, other than her, there, there's probably less work than, than there is in other fields on the impact of the media. Um, and it's an industry that many of us study as a focal industry to look at performance, but not necessarily looking at it in these contexts. Sorry, man, go yeah, ahead. Yeah, I think that, you know, for those of us that are studying the informal sector and non-market strategy, the media is the, at the core of that. So it, we have never stopped looking at the media. So a, a protest that isn't picked up by the media is like a tree falling in the forest. Does anyone hear it, right? So the media is really the lifeblood of social movements. And I think that's one space where we certainly haven't stopped thinking about the media's role. Meg, do you think that polarization in the media leads to different opportunities for activist groups? And is it making things more fragmented? How do we how do we use that? I've really been wondering about that 
because the, the old school social movements literature thinks about the media as in part a legitimizing, a legitimizing force for social movements. So if the media, the New York Times posts about your movement, then it to some extent legitimizes your claim. It says this is something worth looking at. It's something that, that people care about. Um, and I wonder if now that some people don't believe the New York Times is the, the best source of information, if it's basically kind of bifurcating the field into separate audience members and when you protest, your protest is only being heard by the people who already agree with you so it makes it less likely for you to be able to mobilize a movement in the way that you used to be able to mobilize I, I find it interesting. I, I scan the different sort of media every day to kind of compare and so you'll see by the choices of stories they have kind of what sort of you know agenda but also kind of what protests matter, right? What stories matter? What social movements are, are forming? So if you're a fan of Fox News, you'll notice there's like a war on Christmas every year, right? <laughs> and that war on Christmas, there's several segments about that. Uh, O'Reilly used to do a lot of them, and I've watched them. They're pretty much the same story every year, but war on Christmas doesn't appear on any of the other networks that I've seen. And so what is that? Is that a social movement? Is it, a, is it astroturfing? Is it something else? And then, you know, then uh, in other places, like the opioid crisis, you'll see a lot more coverage uh, in some places than others. You'll see a lot of great coverage in local papers where people are suffering from that in, let's say, rural areas that a small newspaper would cover. So it's kind of interesting to see where these social movements kind of take root and then the legitimacy of them based on the, on the readers and the audience mm -hmm. um, is, is something that's, that seems like an interesting area. So, so, but I was interpreting Brian's question a bit more as how do firms strategically use the media or, or, or actually try and manage the media to have some type of influence on external stakeholders. And I don't think we've got good theories or good studies of that. Um, I was actually talking with a, an executive just yesterday, funnily enough, and this is a company that's facing a challenge. This is the, in the Ontario energy sector. And they're facing a challenge with the government around a particular program. The government wants to close it down. Uh, it's a program that companies were very vested in. And the challenge for the CEO was, I don't know if I should take this public. I don't know if I should bring in the media mm. to try and build up some external pressure, some support uh, through media coverage, publicity. It's a way to manage your public reputation. And he was looking for uh, some advice and input. You know, should I take this to the media? I've been trying to lobby the government behind closed doors and through the industry association. But he said it's not really getting anywhere. And I wasn't really feeling I was able to add too much uh, to that. I don't think we've got a good understanding. We don't have that sort of rich set of studies to say, well, look, these are the types of environments where it can be uh, mm -hmm. a good strategic move. Yeah, or should you just tweet directly rather than going through a media yeah. filter? Yeah. You may reach more people, and then some of this rationalization you're talking about uh, changes. So yeah, go ahead. Yeah, just a quick point on the media. I think it's also important to not just look at the media as an external actor, right, and kind of a catalyst for social movements, but also as a potential um, asset in a political portfolio, right, of, of large corporations. So for example, I have a data set on the richest Ukrainian oligarchs, and I compare different types of political strategies across time in terms of maximizing business wealth. So actually what turns out is that owning media assets is far more effective than holding political office, right, in terms of maximizing your corporate value. So I think it's important when we talk about media to not just see it as an objective kind of <coughs> actor, even obviously in this country, right? More and more the US is beginning to look like Ukraine, so I'm actually <laughs> you know, applying some of my insights from the emerging markets to this country. But I think it's just theoretically it's a different perspective on media, right? Just looking at the ownership structure. That's very interesting. Other questions? Yeah, go ahead and back. Sorry, I can't see Charlie. Yeah, so I'm just curious. No one, um, I would say, echoed Tom's call earlier for studying um, broader social welfare. And I am kind of curious, because it seems like with uh, with social strategy or non-market engagement, you might have two goals. One is to amplify your business model, but another might naively be to actually have a positive impact on society. And uh, I guess I'm curious what you're thinking about why that's not coming. Is it just too big, too hard? Um, are the, are the data, is it too squishy? Um, are the data challenges too large? I'm curious, or not conceptually. I mean, I, I fully agree with Tom that it's important to study the overall social welfare. Um, if I don't say anything, it means I don't disagree. But <laughs> <laughs> anyhow, no, but uh, it's what I wanted to people's imagination, I guess. <laughs> But uh, what I wanted to mention is what you observe um, with companies, for example, more and more companies in integrate social environment performance goals in, for example, their executive compensation. So this is a very interesting phenomenon in corporate governance that 
up to, so we looked at the S&P 500 companies, so the, the li largest 500 companies in the US, and about up to 40% of companies use CSR contracting, suggesting that they do care about what's the impact of the company, not only in terms of financial performance, but also social environmental performance. Um, um, so but I think if, if what you're asking is why isn't that a DB, like why aren't we looking at grand dependent variables that would give us a clear idea of, of welfare effects, I think that the problem is endogeneity, right? So, I mean, I'm afraid to use performance as a dependent variable at this point because you're just, you're not going to be able to get it published. So I think that part of the, I mean, like the, the, the actual journal, the rules of getting things published at the moment do kind of constrain us from even doing descriptive, explorative work about the really important problems. And I think that's actually an issue that journals need to, to deal with. Do you think so? You don't? Good question. No. You disagree with me. <laughs> 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 no, I mean, I do think there, there are many important questions out there. Th there's no way you can get it causally identified. There's absolutely no way. I do think research, there's a potential for improvement in terms of trying to rule out alternative stories. Even if you, you, even if you don't get at the causal story at the end of the day, but there's vast uh, potential for Im improving kind of the empirical approach. But I, I do think there's a, an appetite for those studies. Mm -hmm. um. Yeah, so um, I'm sympathetic to Tom's point, but I think practically it's very hard to implement. Economists have got a very specific definition of social welfare. It consists of consumer surplus and producer surplus. So I think we would, uh, as non market strategy scholars, would be wanting to look at the impact on the change in producer surplus and a change in consumer surplus as a result of, say, a change in policy that comes from a firm's particular actions. And that's very, that's very hard to do. I think that, that barrier to, uh, to do that is, is extremely high, to do that convincingly for uh, an, an econ type of audience. Um, Tom, maybe you've had some thoughts on how to actually address this from, a, from an empirical point of view. Or how, no. could, how do we actually make this a bit more feasible? Well, so the, the thing that was motivating me to try to include that was really wanting to hold companies to a higher standard. And I work with the Bureau the Institute for Global Sustainable Enterprise at Michigan a lot. And so I kind of have freedom to speak about some normative things and say, maybe sustainability is good. You know, I'm going to stand <laughs> up for something other than just, you know, maximize income. Um, and so that kind of gives me a little more space to talk about it. But I think it's partly just a reaction to a kind of anger, you know, at seeing the fossil fuel industry capture our government and, you know, say silly little things on the side, like we invested $5 billion in solar this year. Oh, and we invested $5 billion in more oil wells in the Gulf. You know, and we allowed a massive disaster to happen on our watch. You know, and so this business of having some easy CSR stuff be visible and having the important non-market influence be hidden allows companies to greenwash. And I think it's just my deep frustration with that that says, you know, we need to start holding companies to account for what they do in the political arena and not just for the silly little greenwashing stuff they do. And I can't see any other way to get at it than to demand more of their engagement in the political process. And so, you know, transparency seems like a minimal starting threshold. But I totally agree, it's really hard to measure. I mean, we do get a lot of research in environmental economics on the environmental impacts of various things. Mm -hmm. And we can study consumer surplus and producer surplus and environmental impact. And so we can get that sort of constrained economist view of welfare. And some papers do try to estimate that, but, you know, it's hard. I mean, the one takeaway from Tom, other than the research, is that the teaching piece, you were really pushing us also. When we teach students, so take your media example in the back. I thought that was really good. Media can be an asset in the political portfolio. I know you meant it in the sense of like, well, as we study sort of politics and firms, we think about media that way. But think about if we actually told our students to weaponize the media, right, to pursue their particular agendas. And this isn't what he was saying, but think about if we take that to this logical extension, just like it in Teach Porter's Five Forces and, well, how do you reduce rivalry? How do you create barriers to entry? Well, the analog here would be how do you weaponize the media to push your agenda and elect uh, people who are going to basically let you do what you want, right? I mean, that would be the logical extension. So is that what we want to teach our students? It, does it just, does it require some sort of comment at the end to say, well, but I don't really mean to go this far. 
or do we teach them something different? Because the way I see Porter's Five Forces taught in a lot of business schools is, is more analogous to, to what he's talking about with the media side. So how do we do that? Yep, Brandon, good. As you're, as you're saying this, actually, in recalling the conversations I had with the ADA students in Kellogg, where they, they expressed a frustration with the way that we teach non market strategy because many of them come into uh, the business education ready to be sort of taught a lot of things, but also be willing to have kind of their values reinforced. And I think many of the students are frustrated when they come in and we talk about sustainability you know, only as a weapon. And so we have to start to think about like this is a multidimensional student body as well that wants to hear more about these issues than just you know this could help you uh, grow the grow the firm you work for. Yeah. One question I've been having though is is I agree with you, but one question I've been having is whose values? You know, because so they, many of us think that diversity is an important value across all sorts of different dimensions, and we want to take steps to encourage diversity in the faculty among our students, but. Uh, that's not necessarily a consensus view, and the, the, the memo by James Damore at Google um, sort of art articulated that in a very coarse way, and he was fired from Google, and there, it caused a huge sort of uproar of people saying that you know, his values uh, were antithetical to Google's values. So it would require us to then set, a, set some values and really live by them at our schools, such that when they come in, we can say, these are the values we believe in, and we're gonna take a stand, and you're gonna learn these values while we're here, and students can select in. But that isn't, um, in my experience, an uncomplicated process. As I consider teaching a class, it's gonna have, have a lot of politics in it. I mean, I'm gonna talk about cardinal health and opioids and what they should do. I'm gonna talk about the NFL and the anthem. I'm gonna talk about fake news. I'm gonna talk about you know, tech and inequality. These are political issues to me, fundamentally. And I'm thinking carefully about how I'm going to make sure that I don't lose or alienate you know, a good, let's say, 30% of my students who are gonna have a dissenting view um, from what I can see in my class. So that's kind of the, the thing that I'm struggling with in terms of this. So I'm, 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 I want to live out Braden's point, and I'm thinking that the most practical way to do that in a, in a, with a student group that's relatively diverse, I'd say 70, 30 on the political spectrum, with 70% having the generic set of progressive values, let's call them 30% being more conservative on the American political spectrum. And, and how, do you, how do you navigate that? So. You got ideas? Kishore, are gonna help me? Uh, so, so one of the things that, that that's, so we start, all of us are struggling with that issue in the NCA, that's so an but uh, one of the things that resonated, at least uh, when, when I was trying to bring this to the forefront, was okay, you're in a system which gives you all these privileges, the property rights, somebody uh, takes care of everything. When you say you're maximizing profits, you assume it's going to be yours, and you've got residual claim. I mean, these are big things that institutions are giving you for free. And that's not for free. I mean, nobody charges you for it. So, so it's free for you, but society gives it. I'm not saying that you give something back to society, but you cannot like, double it. You cannot, you cannot abuse it. And I think that, that, that even the hardest, uh, hardest MBA thinks about that advice. I, 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 I found that that leads to a better discussion. That's, that's very useful. That's something I can, I can think about. Frank? Well, one way I deal with it, it's actually, it's almost the opposite of what I says, but it's, it's the same idea of this, you know, you want to make the classroom, um, you, you want to make it hard for them and uncomfortable. And one way I make it uncomfortable is if I can figure out what their values are, I actually make them role play in the opposite roles mm -hmm. um, to try to, to try to, you know, switch and be the devil's advocate. Um, the students who, you know, come from, you know, more left view, I, I try to make them sit there and think about, well, what if I had to play to the right, and, or I tell them, hey, you know, you're gonna have to convince somebody on the other side, you know, on, the, on these issues, and so you've, you've gotta move in that direction, at least in terms of your thinking, to be able to understand it. And so that's, that's one way of telling them why that's gonna be important if they're gonna advance their sort of left agenda, or the opposite if they're gonna kind of advance their, their more right agenda. Mm -hmm. I think understanding the political makeup of your constituents, your customers, your students is, is important. So a lot of firms are making investments in that area. So you think about Nordstrom, they have to decide whether to drop Ivanka Trump's brand about a year ago. Um, you know, a decision that was made supposedly for economic reasons, but it had political ramifications. And you think about Target, on the other hand, Target deciding whether or not to respond to 500,000 or more people signing a petition over their new bathroom policy, which was aligned with people, allowing, allowing people to uh, enter the bathroom that corresponded with their gender identity, not what was on their birth certificate. So they took two different strategies. Nordstrom dropped Ivanka's brand, and maybe a lot of it had to do with who their customers were and the analysis of what their political preferences were. 
Target decided to spend $25 million, I think, or $20 million to create bathrooms that were single occupancy to kind of skirt that issue entirely. Probably because of some analysis over who was signing the petition and their customers, where they're distributed across the US. So it's something I think about a lot, which is like political intelligence and firm strategy, which is when these things happen, how do you make decisions? And you know, getting a good understanding who the, what the values are and where what people are actually gonna how people are gonna respond is, is important to that. Question in the back, yeah. Well, yeah. This is a very interesting point. I agree with you. Um, other questions for uh, the panel? Let me ask one more as these as folks are formulating, because I think we have till three, right? So we're, we'll, we'll end later if we need to. <coughs> one of the things we talked about beforehand, so I won't surprise you, was sort of the big open questions. If you had something that you were advising a PhD student to do, or something that's on your horizon, what are the questions that you would recommend? We talked about a few, but are there things that you really think, well, this is something people should go after in a non-market strategy, this is something we know very, very little about. Um, and I'll go first to give you time to think, okay? Mm -hmm. So my sense is what is really interesting is the way that firms settle disputes that traverse countries. So you think about the dispute resolution mechanism in the, in the NAFTA, for example, or in things like the WTO. What's interesting to me is how firm strategy can kind of interact with these multilateral institutions. And as these institutions are sort of being challenged in a lot of ways, what the strategic responses of firms are. And, you know, V talked a lot about how sort of the, the post-World War II neoliberal world order that was constructed from Bretton Woods is something that's kind of, you know, maybe atrophying if people don't stand up and defend it. And it's something that we benefit from in the way Kishore was talking about. Um, what stake do firms have in that system? What should they do in terms of lobbying, contributions, advocacy to keep those institutions strong? That's something I've been thinking a lot about on the international side. It's something I would, I would, I would want to see more people do research on. Um, so that's something I've been thinking about. Can I go to someone who's ready to talk about their uh, I've got big a, idea? Uh, for go me, ahead, Megan. I think that the big tension in corporate governance and in the market strategy that is unexplored and really exciting is underexplored. Is what what is it about a person or a structure or an organization that makes it more or less um, prone to co-optation? So mm -hmm. how do you you know we, in governance we're just obsessed with independence, but how do you actually make a board independent? How do you make, like what kind of person or characteristics of the organizational structure actually makes them behave independently, not just structurally independently? Um, and the same is true in, you know, in Congress. How do, how do we make, what could Congress do to actually, how can we change the rules of the game to make our uh, legislature less prone to co-optation? And the same with the judiciary. So I think there's just a lot of situations in which this would be a really ex exciting research question. And our administrative agencies too. So when I used to work at the White House, there was an issue in Treasury where it's like, a lot of people in Treasury came from Goldman Sachs, right? Same then and now, okay? And, um, and or the financial industry more broadly. And so the question is, you know, is there an inherent conflict of interest with people who are making sort of the, the rules of the financial industry and, uh, and are gonna have, have worked and will go back there? There was another argument, which is that, you know, they have a lot of information about the industry and how it will work. And what's an interesting dynamic is when you're around the table of people who have worked at those banks or who are really in the markets, they will often say, oh, well, if we do that, this is how the market will respond, this is how the firms will respond. And it carries a lot of weight, um, despite the uh, potential for conflicts of interest, because we, we have a sense that they, they've lived in it, they know that, well, that's just a line you can't cross. And so Otiviani and a bunch of co-authors have some really cool models on conflicts of interest. You can think about this with physicians who are being paid by pharmaceutical companies and medical device companies, financial regulators and their role, your wealth advisor who's getting uh, sort of paid to steer you towards particular products, if, depending on what happens with this rule right now. So if you think about all those conflicts of interest, insurance brokers, another one, where it sort of, there's information intersecting with a conflict and sort of what from a social welfare perspective we want in terms of 
walls between sort of uh, these vendors or administrators and potential influencers. That's like a really interesting way to bring it. I, I've been thinking about that a lot, and it's not obvious. I mean, there's a lot of innovation that I found in, that comes from doctors and medical devices working together, medical device companies working together. There's also a lot of conflicts of interest where they're prescribing you something that you don't need, right? But how do you weigh those two things, and, and how do you think about that administratively? It's interesting. Nate, how about, how about you in terms of uh, research stuff? Yeah, I feel, uh, I feel odd here because it's, you know, especially talking about some of the what are the impacts of firms? You know, I, I'm in a political science department, so if you say firms in the hallway of a political science department, Brian will be interested, but no one else will. <laughs> so, and the same in the literature, if you don't connect it to an outcome, for the most pe part, people aren't interested. Mm -hmm. They're not interested in firm behavior. They're interested in the implications of firm behavior on, on what are the, whatever outcome you think is important. So what's interesting for me as well is like the, the lack of comparative work in non-market strategy, and again, there are obviously people doing interesting work, comparative, but, but it's nowhere near the comparative sort of economics work and the amount of work in political science that's being done, comparative institutions. And there's some really rich research on variation in authoritarian regimes and how that impacts economic performance. And I always feel like the, the real missing link is it's hard to make comparisons across these regimes but the one great link is firms, in that you have almost this perfect scaling opportunity where you have firms that operate in multiple markets that are the same firm under different institutional environments. And there's a, a large literature that can help you organize what these institutions are, but I, I feel like that there's, I don't know if it's a low-hanging fruit, but it's a, it's, a, it's a home run if you can hit it, mm -hmm. that you can really make this big contribution also to economics on comparative legal institutions or comparative electoral institutions by really taking your knowledge of firm networks and harnessing that in a way that makes this really big, big contribution. Again, but this is me from political science, um, you know, where people talk about this all the time, so I'm not sure how familiar all these literatures are, but there is a really large comparative literature that does a fantastic job in, in helping think about firm environments across countries that's still not satisfying enough because it's missing the focus on the firms, mm -hmm. that they don't have people studying firms within these in these literature, so it's a it's a huge opportunity. This is really interesting. So, are you have in mind something like you know, city city is a company that's in 150 countries, but the variations of what city is like in different places is something interesting because it's the quote same firm, but it's dealing with a very different set of institutions and markets in these places. And looking within city or within firms like that could yield a lot of traction on the traditional poli sci questions about differences in institutions. Is yeah. that kind of the sense? Yeah, that's really interesting. Okay, Guy or Caroline? Yeah, yeah. sure. Yeah. Um, so it's just interesting. We've got very different ideas of. New opportunities uh, for for a search to make an impact. Yeah, that's good. That's good. That's good. Um, so I've got several. I'll just mention one. Um, I don't think we've got a good sense of how firms compete against each other in non-market strategy. So we tend to think about how firms design, say, for example, campaign contribution strategies or lobbying strategies in, say, a, a particular institutional environment. How does variation in those conditions affect what firms are doing in terms of their particular? Um, lever that they're using for normal market strategy, we tend to abstract away from competition between firms within an industry on non-market dimensions. So Susan very sort of tangentially mentioned how she's competing against uh, general Intel. Intel, she mentioned, was like 10 times bigger, has a big brand, and presumably that's got implications for how her competitor designs its normal market strategy. And AMD and Intel are not necessarily aligned in terms of what they're trying to achieve on the policy front. Um, one of the uh, anecdotal observations that got me thinking about you know, how do firms compete and in some sense try and create a competitive advantage in non-market strategy, and this comes from some work with uh, Davin Reiher uh, over there. Um, we've been looking at how Uber has entered uh, various uh, markets and what's interesting is they typically come up a lot of uh, uh, they come up with a lot of opposition from the incumbent taxi industry. And we noticed that in a lot of jurisdictions, the taxi industry, uh, at least in the US, were regular campaign contributors to local politicians. So they've built up these political connections uh, over time, and partly through financial contributions to electoral campaigns and through lobbying and so forth. So the usual typical non-market strategy levers that we, that, that we think about. And what was interesting with Uber's entry is they don't make campaign contributions at all. Uh, there's one example in Seattle where there was a referendum, but generally they don't make campaign contributions. So this must be a very strategic decision by them. They're, of course they're lobbying, they tend to mobilize their customers and their 
and sometimes they're, they're taxi drivers, they're taking very different routes to competing in the non-market arena with an industry incumbent. So the question is why? And we can think about lots of and sort of plausible hypotheses as to why we see this, this different type of approach, but it gets to this sort of deeper question, I think, you know, how do firms compete on non-market dimensions in a contested type of setting, which I think is the, the usual typical, uh, t uh, typical industry uh, uh, situation where we've got competition bet uh, bet between companies. I think it's a big area of, of open research. I thought even you were going within sort of the, the ride-sharing market, so Uber mm -hmm. versus Lyft yeah. in their approach yeah. to dealing with different markets. That's another, yeah. I think, interesting right. angle. Yeah. And as you know, with Uber's trouble, Lyft has sort of tried to seize momentum, making a million dollar donation to the ACLU right yeah. after this, yeah. and trying to basically convince people that Uber is the, is the bad one and we're the good one, yeah. which is kind of an interesting But again, that's, that's illustrative of this. Uh, rivalry but yeah. between firms on on non market dimensions. Yeah, which is gonna, and then you know Tesla and the car dealerships is another example. Yeah. Car dealers are That's in every right. congressional district, yeah. so yeah. they make a lot of donations, yeah. and then you know they're gonna prevent, they want to prevent Tesla uh, from you know doing online sales, and they make want to make them establish dealerships which are expensive and yeah. change their business model. Yeah. So That's like another way to yeah. to think about it. Caroline, what about you? Um, <clears throat> I would say two areas. One of them I already mentioned before. I think. Considering the government as a customer of companies and how companies can compete for government procurement contracts, that's a, um, a, um, there's huge potential for, for research there. And then the other area, and this connects to what we discussed earlier, so I think this morning we talked a lot about how do we, that we are a fragmented field coming from different disciplines and, and language. Um, and I would li like to link this to what Braden mentioned about at the end of the day, very often we go back and talk to a different audience. Um, and I think there's a potential in terms of how is non-market strategy relevant for whether it's entrepreneurship, innovation, um, um, you name it, kind of within the management field and mm -hmm. try to impact, have, a, have an impact on the research of our colleagues which might actually also have an impact on teaching, curriculum, et cetera, et cetera. So that's more a system thinking approach, I guess. Yeah, I also took a lot from Braden's point about the difference between a unified paradigm and kind of talking to each other better versus beachheads in the discipline and kind of, or in the area and speaking outwards, which should, we should transform the fields that we actually participate in. And I think that was like a very useful way to think about it and maybe a more realistic uh, attribution. And so, although, you know, I think both are admirable, but that is probably more of what we're doing right now in, some, in, a, in, a, in a service in and of itself. So, um, I think, uh, barring any more questions, I think people need coffee. I want to thank uh, <laughs> Caroline and Guy and Nate and May and the organizers for uh, hosting thank us. You, and, uh, no, it was fantastic. Good fun. Hopefully, we'll follow up offline.